In the Gun, episode 146. I'm Skyla Callahan. That is the signal caller, Jed Drenning. And uh, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Not a whole lot going on at this portion of the offseason, but we do have some topics that we want to discuss, including uniforms, a new college football format, and oh yeah, a couple of new guys in town, or new cats, if you will, a couple of transfers from Northwest. We're going to get to all that here in just a second. But first, as always, this episode of EITG is brought to you by Bet Online, your number one source for all your betting needs. Bet Online, where the game starts. And also a shout out to our guys at Toothman Ford. We all know cars cost less in Grafton. So, Jed, let's let's start here with, with some designing, some fashion. Uh, there's been some rumors out there that West Virginia could be getting a set of black uniforms. The rumor is that they will unleash these things for the home opener, the season opener against Penn State. Very non-traditional against a very traditional team. Um, what's your feelings on this? Because I, I'm a big, I, I wanna see blue, blue, gold for that Penn State game, but I don't mind the black uniforms as I think it's just a matter of when you actually use them. I'm not a fan for, the, for it in the Penn State game, but I don't know, we'll see. What do you think? I am for anything that benefits the program, the benefits could come in multiple forms, whether it's you sell additional jerseys to raise money, whether it's yeah, uh, more sizzle and appeal to recruits. I quite frankly don't care. We, we placed the poll on, uh, let me pull that up. We placed the poll on our Twitter account and uh, the results on the Twitter account were overwhelmingly in favor of black uniforms. It was just divided among the answers. We had four possible answers. Uh, in the poll. Uh, yes, the kids love it. Uh, that's 30%. So 30% agreed because the kids love it. I uh, had a no get off my lawn answer. 10% <laughs> went with that. Uh, we know who I you are. Yes. Yeah. And then I had a yes, but with gold and blue trim. In other words, some people want the old gold and blue uh, yeah. to be present within the black uniform design. And that actually won. That was 34% of the answers. And then some people, 26% said, no, just it's a bad look. So what you're looking at is 64% said, yes, we like it in some form. 36% went against it. Uh, but And then there was an answer in the comments, and I kind of agree with this. Uh, Mickey Motown uh, said, you forgot one. I don't care what the uniforms are if we are winning. And that, that's kind of <laughs> where I come down with it. I, I really yeah. don't care. It's like. A lot of people will say, well, you know, it's uh, it's not West Virginia football. If it's not the old golden blue and, and people don't recognize us because our uniforms have changed too much. When Don Nealon came to town, he wanted to make sure that we put a uniform design in that when you watched us on TV, you'd know who we are. Well, that's true. But at the same time, Don Nealon came to town from Michigan. And there's still times that I have kids even watching a Mountaineer game and they told me they thought Michigan was playing. It wasn't West Virginia because West Virginia looks so much like Michigan. Yeah. So I'm for anything that helps the program. Uh, now I, I do, if I had my druthers, yeah, I'd probably prefer the traditional old golden blue, but it's not a deal breaker for me. It's really not. I, uh, you know, well, I'm, I'm thing, not a fan of some of the looks, but I don't care. Right. And I mean, well, the other thing is the way you help change that narrative is to win. Like if you start winning enough games, people will look at you and think, "Oh, that's West Virginia playing." Oh, wait, no, that that, that is actually Michigan. But I mean, I'm 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 there with and, you. And on you the know, grades. the other part of it is, Skyler. You know, people say, "Well, Penn State doesn't do it. Texas doesn't do it." Yeah, and if we had their pedigree, maybe yeah, we could get away with that to. too. Notre Dame does it. Ohio State does it. <laughs> Come on, I mean, yeah. who do we think we are? That again, I get it. In a perfect world, I'd rather see us in the traditional blue helmet, blue jersey, gold, old gold pants. I, but it it's not a deal breaker to me. I just I'm not that wrapped up in it. If it helps the program on any level, if there's just enough sizzle to get another recruit or two, or enough peel or curb appeal uh, to help us there, because the kids think it's cool. If if you sell an extra couple jerseys to put money in the coffers, whatever helps the program, that's what I'm for. I'm not tied up in what you come out wearing when you play team X, team Y, or team Z. Uh, but th that's kind of where I land on it, right? Yeah. You look good in everything when you win, right? So, I mean, sure I don't do. care yeah. if it's blue, gold, white, black, gray. I mean, now, I will say, and I've said this before, I'm not a huge fan of the grays. I think we 
all on this show have kind of felt that sort of way. I would prefer well, my stance, the Scott, over the gray. I've said many times, I'm not a fan of the gray. Yeah. But here's one way you can make me a fan. If you want to have an all gray uniform at the home game scheduled closest to September 11th and make it a Chris Gray out, sign me up. I am absolutely all for it. Outside of that, yeah, not in fan of the gray look. But, yeah, I agree with you. Well, speaking of those uniforms, it, it got me wondering because if you've been in the news recently or watching the, the social media uh, channels, EA Sports is bringing back college football. I'm, for one, going to be thrilled for this. My wife, not so much because she's not going to see me a whole lot in the summer because I'm going to yeah. be cooped up in my, my bed mode. playing. But, uh, but anyways – the new college football game is coming out this summer. They announced uh, earlier this week that they're going to have all 134 FBS schools in the game. However, those uniforms that we just talked about, whether it's the black or potentially an all new set of West Virginia uniforms, they may not be in the game because of the timing that they're going to get released. Um, but it's pretty cool though that EA Sports is coming back. We've got a game back for the first time in over a decade. I've been waiting for this for so long. I'm like, I, I'm okay with Madden. It's, it is what it is, but I love to be able to use West Virginia, get them to the national championship, become the next Bama, be unrealistic. It's just, it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. And we talked about the timing of the uniform release. We don't know what will happen because yeah. these games are more nimble than they once were True. with the uploads that are available and things of that nature. Who knows? But, uh, yeah, you yeah, know, we're all excited about it. And I saw one Twitter account uh, that has a pretty significant following post their top 25 players to play with on the new game. Yeah. And number four was Jaheim White. So Jaheim White, the jitterbug. I imagine Jaheim will be fun to play with on the new game. Are you telling me Garrett Green won't be fun to play with on the new exactly. game? Exactly. And then the interesting part is I understand that they sent out the solicitation for NIL offers. EA Sports did. And unless I'm mistaken, they were offering, if you take part in this, you get $600 cash and a free copy of the game. And if you're not going to take part in it, you'll kind of just be, you know, a blank player, whatever the case might be. We, we've seen those types of things in these games in the past, but by and large, you're probably going to see actual names on the uniforms, which makes it kind of cool as well. So yeah, it's going to be fun to play with Jaheim. It's going to be fun to play with Garrett Green. Uh, whatever you guys want to do. And if you want to jump into dynasty mode, that used to be my favorite back in the <laughs> yeah. days when I was playing these games. Uh, but because I wouldn't actually play the game, I would kind of just the geek and me would let the system play the game as I was building a team. But uh, they're talking about the, the dimension that name image likeness will play the dimension that the portal will play. Uh, so there's going to be different challenges. They're going to try and keep it as, similar to the actual new version of college football as you can. But, but uh, yeah, it's exciting times. I mean, it's exciting news. You know, a, a lot of that was tabled, you know, back when you had the first round of lawsuits that led to name image likeness before the Austin case, but uh, you know, with the kid from UCLA, but, but uh, it's good to see it coming back around and it's good to see the kids will be benefiting from it, but uh, exciting times. It was a, a fan favorite and I'm sure it will be again, and who knows if, uh, you know, maybe if some some upload will be available to whenever the uh, West Virginia black uniforms, whatever yeah. they might look like, are announced, those will be ma made available in the game as well. Who knows? Uh, I mean, I've got all sorts of ideas of what EA should include. I, I did an article last week about the five things that they should do WVU related. My number one thing is they've got to get the first down chant in there. I think that would be so cool to be able to hear that, the first down WVU, clap, move along. And I think, too, and it's a long stretch. There's no way in, in hell that they're going to ever be able to do this because of the licensing situation. But, man, how cool would it be to just sit there at the end of a game after you just beat Pitt 214 to nothing on freshman mode yeah. to hear yeah. Country yeah. Roads playing? I mean, that would be so freaking cool. Oh, that would be perfect. But I understand it's perfect. not going to happen. But anyways... We're going to go ahead and take a quick break. When we come back on the other side, we're going to talk college football playoff format, which has been expanded to 12 teams, along with the two new guys that West Virginia picked up in the transfer portal. We'll get to that here in just a second. 
Nobody supports the Blue and Gold Mountaineers like Toothman Ford. With over 20 NIL deals and counting, Toothman Ford continues to rally behind our student athletes. And it's time we rally and support the dealer that supports the Mountaineers. Not only does Toothman Ford offer the best prices in the state on pre-owned, their never over MSRP campaign on new Fords guaranteed to, to save you thousands. thousands. Drive with pride all season long, knowing you're supporting the dealer that fuels our Mountaineers. Toothman Ford, where cars cost less. In Grafton and at ToothmanFord.com. For more West Virginia Mountaineer football content, be sure to follow us on Twitter at In the Gun Podcast. For nearly 20 years, Fortis has been the nation's leader in providing guaranteed roof performance programs for commercial buildings. Fortis offers roof performance solutions that feature extensive initial and ongoing reconditioning for commercial buildings as an alternative to traditional replacement with long-term performance guarantees that are backed by global leader Lloyds of London. Fortis offers a comprehensive range of roof performance management programs that provide financial security, extend the life of our customers' roofs, and make a significant impact on ROI. Fortis is currently improving performance and increasing ROI for customers at more than 4,800 locations with more than 140 million square feet protected, including many Fortune 500 companies that have turned to Fortis to save money, gain financial certainty, and extend the life of their existing roofs. Fortis has helped customers save more than $520 million in capital roof replacement costs for an average ROI of over 250%. To learn more, visit fortis.us.com. Fortis, roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. You work the land, you just gotta be a jack of all trades type. There's just too much to do. So if you gotta be a welder or a farmer or a ditch digger, that's just who you are that day. And tomorrow, you can be somebody else. Get your coyote at the new location of Johnston Equipment between Weston and Buckhannon. Hey, this is Charles Wesley Godwin and you are in the gun. Back in the gun, and once again, we were talking about some college football playoff here, what that is going to look like moving forward, and some of the transfers. But first, a uh, shout out to our new friends of the show, Johnston Equipment. Check out their new location along Route 33 between Weston and Buck Cannon. And then also a shout out to Fortis for Root Performance and Financial Certainty Guaranteed. Be sure to visit Fortis.us.com. So, Jed. We go from 4 to 12. That was announced earlier this week that the the new format and how it's going to work. We'll get into that. But this is the new timeline. So this is how crazy this is going to be. When you had the 14 playoff, it already seemed so super crunched when you have recruiting the high school kids, you've got the transfer portal, you got signing day, all that stuff. Now it's going to be even more crazy, more hectic because the quarterfinals will now start on December 31st and January 1st, so New Year, around New Year's. Semifinals, January 9th and 10th. The national championship, Jed, is not even until January 20th. So this thing is really going to get pulled out. It's going to be a long process. I'm all here for it because that means it shrinks the offseason, but I'm not sure the coaches love the fact that they've got all that stuff going on in that short time frame. Something's got to change with the recruiting windows, but I don't know how they go about that. It's already, as you touched on, Skylar, very crazy, very hectic. Everything jammed into December the way that it is. It used to be at least you had a wider berth and some breathing room with National Signing Day being in early February. But with that thing being pushed back into December for a number of reasons, uh, it, it's made it even crazier. Uh, so I would imagine there's more change coming on the calendar front, but we don't know what that's going to look like. There's, yeah. there's no perfect way to lay all this out with all these uh, different things that have to be done at various times. You just touched on the portal. Uh, we, we talk about recruiting. Where, where's the best place to have your early enrollment period? We, we haven't settled on anything yet that makes perfect sense. But when you're looking at this, first of all, the four team, playoff format i would argue it didn't work out the way they thought it might because one of the notions behind it at least in spirit was to allow more teams in or more teams to have access uh to provide for more meaningful games being played in november that didn't and happen. that's i mean what's happened instead is it's it's created a safety net 
for the top six or seven teams. That's really what it's done. Right. Uh, so the margin for error for those top six or seven blue bloods uh, has increased. And the haves have increased even more over the have nots. And it's, it's outside of a couple of exceptions, hurt access uh, because it's, it's fostered for the first time in the history of the game, super teams where you had this situation, this is pre portal pre NIL. You had this situation where, I mean, you had four first round receivers on one rostered Alabama. You had th three first round quarterbacks on one rostered Alabama. Well, that's what the 14 playoff did for those teams. They gobbled up all the recruits. They were the most coveted destination because they had the access to the playoffs and all these prized recruits want to play on the biggest stage for the biggest prizes. Well, now NIL has changed that. Now the portal has changed that. So you already see, we talked about how disrupted even Alabama was last year by losing four coveted recruits in one portal cycle, which is why their offensive line struggled and allowed the most sacks in the SEC. And they won despite of it, not because of it. But even the Blue Bloods are being impacted by NIL and by the portal in different ways than the non-Blue Bloods. But now here comes the expanded playoff to 12 teams. So I would argue this is very good for the sport at large because now you're going to have, we've said often, C.J. Stroud, who was a standout at Ohio State, Bryce Young, who was a standout at Alabama. These are both California kids. They traveled all the way across the country to play for those two brands because they thought that was the only chance they had to compete in a playoff game. Well, now kids like that will stay closer to home from a regional standpoint. So it's it's good for the game. Uh, the talent will be spread a little bit more across the country, and maybe you'll be a little bit more enticed to stay home regionally. Now, that doesn't mean the Blue Bloods won't still be the Blue Bloods. Of course they will. But it's going to change the dynamic at least a little bit by granting more access. And the best thing about it, it makes the regular season more meaningful than it's ever been. This, this argument against, well, the regular season doesn't even mean anything anymore. Are you kidding me? We would play 60 games in late November, and three of them mattered. And you're talking about the most meaningful regular season with 55 to 57 regular season games not mattering much on the national landscape? Well, now teams are going to be jockeying for home field, jockeying for a top four spot to get the bye. So you're going to have meaningful football all the way down through November with more teams playing more meaningful games than you've ever seen because of this. When you're allowing 12 teams in, four automatic buys for the highest ranked conference champions, one through four, five automatic qualifiers for the five highest ranked conference champs, and then seven at large. They call it the five plus seven format for that reason. Five AQs, automatic qualifiers as conference champs, and then seven at large. There's going to be teams battling for those spots all the way through November. So 12 spots could mean that 25 or 30 teams are still playing meaningful football the last couple of weeks in November. I think it's great for the regular season. It's great for the sport. And these teams, these, these, these fans that would sometimes argue, well, now if you lose, it doesn't matter what, you know what, depending on what, what the logo on your helmet was, there were times in the past, if you lost, it didn't matter. Yeah. I mean, we saw teams lose their last game of the year and make the playoffs. So at least now this is somewhat of an equalizer because yeah. Anything that moves away from the Olympic figure skating approach just by a bunch of judges in a, in a committee room deciding and at least let you settle a little bit more of it on the football field, which no, it absolutely was not because you weren't treating these games on the field the same. So stop saying you were. So if you can put them in a tournament and let them settle it on the field and you know what, if there's blowouts in the first round, so be it. That will work itself out over time as more access is granted to more programs and they use that to recruit with. But not only, Skyler, when these CFP leaders met in Dallas, of course, that was representatives from the major conferences, the group of five conferences and Notre Dame. Not only did they talk about the dates that you just mentioned in the five plus seven, 12 team format, which begins this year. But they even tinkered with the possibility by as early as 2026, adding two more teams to go to 14. Uh, they, they threw around different possibilities of what that might look like. There were multiple iterations discussed. Ross Dellinger from Yahoo Sports, our buddy Ross Dellinger, did a great job breaking this down. 
there were varying numbers of auto bids within those 14 teams, uh, as many as 12 automatic qualifiers in some of the uh, discussions. Uh, it, really what it would land, if you had 14 teams, what they discussed was a buy for teams one and two. Now, here's how this would work. Let's let's jump back to the 12-team format, which we start with this year. Here's how this is going to work. The 12-team format is a five plus seven. So you have the top four teams getting a buy in the first round. They are the top four, excuse me, the highest four-ranked conference champions. They're all going to get a buy. But you're allowing in the five highest-ranked conference champions. Well, don't look now, but the Pac-12 has dissolved. So it's no longer P5, it's P4. So what that means, in effect, and in, in reality, the four P4 conference champs will get in because they'll most likely be the four highest-ranked conference champs. That's not etched in stone, but most likely. We've seen exceptions in the past. Cincinnati, when they made the playoffs, being one of them. But that means that the highest-ranked group of five conference champ will get in as well. Now, let's walk through what that looks like. That doesn't mean they'll be ranked number five in the 12-team playoff format. What it means is, for instance, last year, Tulane. Tulane would have qualified and made the playoffs because they would have been the fifth highest ranked conference champion, but they were ranked, I think, in the last ranking by the committee going into the playoffs, 17 or 18. So what this would mean is Tulane would have catapulted up to number 12, the number 12 spot in the playoffs. Yes, they get in as the fifth highest ranked conference champ, but they would play that opening round game on the road because remember the format, one through four get the bye, Five through 12 don't get to buy. They play an opening round game on campus site. So five through eight hosting nine through 12 tournament style. So Tulane would have been on the road as uh, the number 12 seed, but they would have gotten in because they would have been the fifth ranked highest, you know, fifth highest ranked conference champion. So I appreciate the expansion. I appreciate more access. Uh, I, I, you know, at least we get to stop pretending that the regular season matters. Yeah. Uh, as much as people like to pretend, and I can't use the word pretend enough because it absolutely has not. Uh, if you lost a game, that mattered for some teams, but it didn't matter for other teams. So stop pretending like it mattered for all teams. It didn't. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think it's going to create some interesting matchups. I'm all for seeing Southern teams go north in December for an on-campus game. I think that's terribly exciting. That might be, I've said many times, my favorite part of this 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 new format or these on-campus games in the opening round. I think that's going to be awesome before you get into the bowl system starting in round two and moving on with those dates you talked about. But, uh, yeah, I like it. I think it's good for the game. Uh, and not only that, but the estimated value for ESPN of a 12-team format, Skyler, $1.3 billion, with a B, billion dollars. So I think that's one of the reasons it's great, because it's a $700 million raise for those involved, the schools, the teams, the conferences. So we, we, we've said this in the past. The NFL, and, and I'll tell you who does a great job of discussing this all the time, is Rick Neuheisel. The NFL is sitting there with a market value. They, they have about a $10 billion market with 32 teams. And Roger Goodell, the commissioner, has said, look, they want to get to $25 billion by 2027. No, I'm not betting against them. So they're at $10 billion in the money they generate, the revenue they generate with 32 teams. College football sitting here with 130-plus FBS teams, 60-plus Power 4 teams. College football generates, I use the, this term loosely, only three and a half billion dollars. So I do see potential to close that gap. You're never going to catch the NFL, nor should that be what you, you aspire to do. But I don't think you're maximizing the dollar and making the most of the opportunity uh, unless you close that gap. And we're already seeing, even with a 12 team format, that gap being closed. Are you telling me you can't get to six or seven billion instead of three and a half billion? What that would mean to the schools, what that would mean to the players? what that would mean across the board of the conferences, I think you absolutely can. And I think this 12-team format is a major step in that direction. 
Yeah, I mean, and two, like, there's all these fans out here that say, oh, well, you're just diluting it. It's it's not going to – these teams in the back end of the playoff are never going to make any noise. Well, let's see, right? I mean, how many years have this – in this college football playoff format where you have the four teams, have there been blowouts? Even going back to the BCS where it's just the top two, there have been some one-sided championship games where it was just the top two. So no matter what, there's always that possibility. But you're not just going to take that chance away from all these other kids – just because you're afraid that something might happen, kind of like the the situation with Florida State. Oh, they were worried about them getting waxed in the in the first round. Who knows? Let them go out there and play. If that's what happens, it's what happens. They deserve to be there. They won with their freaking third string quarterback for crying out loud. Who's to say Tulane can't go in and pull a crazy upset? Cincinnati or somebody in years past that was. You never know. I mean, look at college basketball. It happens every single year. We have a Cinderella that makes some sort of run, and I'm never advocating for football to go to a deep playoff like that. But I think the more teams you give the opportunity, the more crazier things can happen. And look how successful March Madness has been. I mean, if you can kind of replicate that to a smaller degree, I think it's only going to be good for the game. And like you said, it gives more teams chances. You don't feel like you have to go to those – three or four or five schools to get that opportunity, you can do it. If, you, if lightning strikes once in a year at West Virginia, it could happen. So I love it. I, and, I think you know, it's great. If you're a worthy champion, this shouldn't prevent you from running the table and winning exactly. the championship. Exactly. Yes. If you're a worthy champion, blow the teams out. Fine. Do it. Let's see it. Yeah. Do it every year. Do it consistently without exception. If you're a worthy champion, allow that to happen. And it's just – any anything that gets you further away from less conversations and more football, I'm all for. Uh, you'll still have conversations. You'll still have debates. There'll be heated debates about who's 12 versus who's 13. Good. I love that part of it. But let's at least mitigate it and marginalize to some extent the the power that these committees have in turning this into figure skating. The East German judge gives you a 9.2. Play it on the field and know the regular season is not playing it on the field because you don't treat the games the same. Yeah. For instance, here's one of many examples of people talking out of their mouths. They're now upset that in a 12-team format, a 9-3 and three LSU team would get in as one of the lower seeds, so let's say last year. okay? But these same people who are complaining that a 9-3 and three LSU team because they were 2-3 and three against ranked teams, well, the same people complaining about that are building Alabama's resume in part because they beat that LSU team. Yeah. One of the reasons you're telling me Alabama was worthy of the playoffs, well, look, they went through the SEC and had these ones. They beat LSU. Well, no, wait a minute. You were just telling me how LSU is not very good and shouldn't be in here. So why are you using the win over LSU as a reason to put out? Stop it. Let's just determine these yourself. things. You know what? And Alabama did beat LSU. And if Alabama is truly better than LSU, then I would like to think, if it comes down to it, LSU going into Tuscaloosa, Alabama, as a worthy champion, should be able to beat them again. I have no problem with this, with rematches. No problem with it. It's fascinating. Yeah. It adds nuance. It adds things to the game that we heretofore haven't seen. I am all for it because at least – we can pretend a little less that the regular season is where you play it out on the field when the regular season games are not remotely treated as the same. Yeah. Some teams are allowed to lose. Some teams are not. This is a step in the right direction. Now, you're never going to have a full tournament style let everybody in and play it out on the field. No, I, I agree, nor should you. But you have to mitigate the power of the committee and the Olympic figure skating model to some extent. I'm happy with this as at least a middle of the road resolution. Yeah. Cause I mean, if you're West Virginia, I mean, you lose that first game and you're like, all right, well, if we want to make a run, we've pretty much got to run the table. Now, if as soon as you lose that second game, you're screwed. <laughs> you're not getting in over a two loss SEC team or maybe even a three. Loss. So you just hit on it, Skylar. You just hit on it. There are people out there listening to what you just said and say, good, you should think like that. Well, <laughs> okay. My problem is you're not thinking like that. If you're in the SEC, only if you're in West right. Virginia. Right. You know, because you can go on the road and beat this LSU team that we're all here and is not that good and shouldn't be in the playoffs and get a bunch of credit for beating them. But it's not the it. same somewhere else. Yes. In other words, people are sitting, the people that are sitting there saying, good, West Virginia should be thinking like that. 
Yes, so should the rest of the country then, but the rest of the country's not. Because the rest of the country, depending on if you're in the Big Ten or the SEC, recognizes their margin for error is much different than the other teams. Sometimes that's because Easy. of a tougher schedule. Sometimes it's not. But the brand matters. This helps resolve that. Yeah. And, and two, the other part of this is, look, we're shifting closer and closer to an NFL model with the NIL, all that stuff. Oh, yeah, constantly. And if these kids want to play at the next level, they're going to have to play 17 games in just the regular season. That's not, not counting the three preseason games. That's 20. Not counting the, the playoffs, which might be 23 or 24. Oh, yeah. So don't don't complain about, all oh, you're, you're making them play more games. If that's what they want to do at the next level, they're going to have to play a lot more. So get used to it. And plus they're getting paid now. So I, I don't know. But let's – one of the only levels that doesn't do that. I mean, Mike right. Leach talked about that for years, the late Mike Leach. Yeah. You know, this is the only the level league. that we don't do that. Half of the NFL gets into the playoffs. Half of the NBA gets into the playoffs. I'm not saying that we should get half of the college football into the playoffs, but come on, more than four. Yeah, I always say the games. NHL. You, you don't want to reach a point where the NHL and NBA have reached. Where yeah. you're, you're you going play the regular past. season. You play the regular season not to determine who goes to the playoffs, but to determine who doesn't. <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. You don't want to reach that point, and we're far from that. But right. there's 130-some-odd teams. The fact that you're letting 12 in now with the conversation about 14, much different animal. You still have, without question, the most valuable and coveted regular season. Uh, this will create a much longer list of games that matter in November, and I yeah. think that's exciting. Absolutely. Absolutely. You hit the, the, the nail right on the head there. And uh, let's go ahead and transfer into our last segment here. And that is the transfer pickups, Jaheem Joseph and um, Hollis, Garnett Hollis Jr. Lost the name for a minute. These two kids from Northwestern, I think, are very underrated, very overlooked. Um, a lot of really good potential from both of them. Joseph kind of there's a little bit of a late bloomer there at Northwestern, but man, he's he's one of the top rated safeties according to Pro Football Focus. And Hollis, I mean, this kid I'm excited about. He's got a lot of length, six foot two, 200 plus pounds. I think he could be one of the biggest impact transfers in this class. He could be. Uh, I, I like the combination. Uh, yeah, Jaheim Joseph brings a lot of value. He's going to be a back end player. Uh, he can play either free safety or cat safety. Uh, he's been productive. He's played a lot of football at Northwestern. Uh, missed a significant portion of one of his four seasons with injury. But uh, this is a kid that's going to bring immediate value. He's going to battle to play. He's going to battle to start. He's going to push the others on that back end in that safety group. Uh, so Jaheim Joseph, yes, when he was on the field at Northwestern, uh, he was productive, and, and Pro Football Focus, I think, had him as the fourth highest ranked yeah. safety out of all the safety transfers, Dang. and there's a ton of safety transfers, so you're you're in high cotton right there, and Garnett Hollis, that's the key. This kid is productive. He has ball skills. Uh, you, you talked about the length. He's coming in at six foot two. Scholar, it's been a long time now. Uh, that since we've had that kind of length, the corona, you, you almost have to go back. I, I think of Russell. Yep. Uh, Russell Douglas thought. had that kind of length. Um, and he was a ball hawk. He, he had a nose for things. Uh, I'm not making a comp here. I'm just saying that kind of length matters. 6'2", 200 plus pounds. Uh, he has the build. Uh, the skill set's there. The traits are there. He's going to push to start. He's going to push to play at the next level. Potentially, if things break for both these kids, they both could push to play at the next level. Joseph has two years left. Uh, Hollis, a one-year player. So, yeah, I'm terribly excited. Are we going to see a situation maybe – this is even pre-portal. Uh, it's back when it wasn't really as in vogue to see transfers in the early days of grad transfers first starting to make a splash or an impact. Remember what Ryan Mundy did? when Rich was here, when he transferred in from Michigan as a grad transfer for that one year. I mean, you could maybe see Hollis have that kind of impact, but at corner instead of safety. And and think about it. We're now building a room, uh, fostering competition at that corner spot uh, and on the back end and in the back end in general with those safeties where we, you have TJ Crandall, who was already an addition from Colorado State. He's a physical kid. 
uh, who's somewhat long as well. He's a six one kid. So yeah. w- when you're looking at what you return uh, in these spots, you brought in more length than what you had. So I think it says a lot for the potential of what we could have. Both kids are going to push the start. And guess what? These kids that we're bringing in will all push the start. And if they don't start, they're going to be quality depth, which is something we've lacked in recent history. So if you can build a defense that has true depth, which is what we're working towards, uh, I think you're onto something. And uh, it, it, I think that, the, that both these kids can contribute right away, potentially even start right away, depending on how things break. But you know what? Uh, in the ever-evolving landscape of this new age of the portal, the next window opens April 15th. That ain't Every over team yet. in America is going to continue <laughs> to make moves. Yeah, every team in America is going to continue to make moves. So the pieces are falling into place. Uh, and these are these are these two kids are the types of players that they can help a lot of teams defensively. So you got to think maybe what's gaining purchase now with some of these kids is we had on a couple weeks ago Drew Fabianich as the first GM in the history of West Virginia football. What Drew offers is from a developmental standpoint, uh, a guy with the eye to tell you the areas that you need to enhance if you want to play at the next level. I mean, he has this long history in the NFL as a scout, and he's able to tell the kids as he brings them in, look, I want to help develop you to prepare you to play at the next level. If that's truly the brass ring you seek to capture, your best opportunity might be here with me. First, you're putting a lot of stuff on tape. Second, I have an eye to tell you what you need to work on, what you need to enhance. So you're satisfying a lot of things and checking a lot of boxes if you end up playing for West Virginia. And uh, I can't help but think that maybe that's part of the conversation with some of these kids as well. So, uh, and and you got to like the fact that we haven't mentioned this. When you think Northwestern, look, uh, these aren't aren't a a bunch of dum-dums coming in here, right? So. Uh, you know, they're going to be functionally intelligent kids. That matters too. It especially matters if you want to learn a playbook in one short off season and try and impact things right away on the fly. So uh, they're going to be two smart kids to uh, high IQ kids. Uh, so I think they're great additions to the team, great additions to the defense and great additions to the locker room. Yeah. And really too, I think what a lot of people are, are forgetting here, we're getting all so in, in depth with all these newcomers and this is a good thing, right? we're not even talking about Jacoby spells or some of these yep. freshmen that are about to come in, or if Montre Miller is able to get a waiver and he's able to come back for one more year, like there is actual depth there. And that's something that has not existed there for the last few years. When you have more tools, well, in the toolbox, safety. Yeah, right? safety is, Marcus Floyd, oh, Anthony yeah. Wilson, Aubrey Burks. I mean, we got a lot of names that have played a lot of yep. football. You're right, Scott. Yeah. So, I mean, depth is a huge part of it. When you get to November, in December, you want to play that meaningful football that we just talked about. You've got to have guys two and three deep because at some point it's the inevitable. You're going to have injuries on your roster. And last year when Aubrey Burks went down, it was noticeable. When he, Even when he came back, it took him a little while to get back to form. So now that you have those pieces in place, it gives you a better chance to kind of keep things afloat instead of sinking, uh, as, you, as you will. So you want to think depth doesn't matter? Well – what was the single most damaging play last year? Duh. Yeah. And who wasn't it. on the field for it? No, yeah. no, no. Houston. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hail Mary in Houston. Absolutely. Aubrey Burks not on the field. Yeah. So we had guys rushing into duty. So, yeah, if you can fortify yourself, your roster with some quality depth, uh, it, it's going to matter on you know both little things, big things. Uh, it, Garnett Hollis, if you want to see his ball skills, I would encourage people to do this. Track down that interception that he made in the red zone in the end zone against yeah. Duke, and you'll see what kind of ball skills that he has. Yeah. yeah, that was yeah. insane. Yeah. And two, uh, Joseph, he ended his career at Northwestern with two picks in the in the bowl game against Utah. He had three so, picks in his yeah. last two games. Yeah. yeah. So you talk about finishing hot. There you go. Exactly. That's how you increase your transfer portal stock right there. So absolutely. So anyways, that'll do it for us here today on In The Gun. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube at In The Gun Podcast and make sure you follow us at that same handle on X. And uh, we'll be back next week. I believe we'll try to get Wes and Big O back. I'll get back into my behind the camera duties as that's probably where I'm, I'm better served. So we'll get those guys back next week. And as always, 
being here and telling here about your favorite WV football podcast. You've been in the gun.